Good morning, friends. I want to extend a warm welcome to you today. Everyone is welcome here. This community is a safe place in which we support each other in the sake of task of becoming, celebrate the transcending mystery of life, and rely on the transforming power of love. The theme of today's service is looking back for a better way forward. If we look back a bit into our UU heritage, there is one particularly outstanding, one particularly outstanding feature. We have always been the people who have stood with the poor, the downtrodden, the oppressed, and the outcast. Standing in the right place at the right time is an important part of our UU spirituality. Standing up for justice, for the marginalized, for the earth, for love and for compassion is who we are. Last week during the service, I received an email from a person in our Zoom congregation. The email was a response to Reverend Vogel's sermon about how the Unitarian Church he served in New York was standing against hatred in all its multifarious forms. The center, of the, the center of the email relayed to me that they were left feeling judged and inadequate because they weren't doing enough. My response is twofold. First, sometimes the person that it is most difficult to stand with is yourself. To give yourself grace, to let go of those long running programs of the mind that lead to unrealistic self-assessment, condemnation and judgment of oneself and besides, every day is a new day with its own opportunities to stand with. Second, at this time in our nation, there is much opportunity to stand with those that are hurting in ways that do not require you standing in the freezing rain outside a fickle congressperson's office or march down Main Street in support of an oppressed peoples. There is a group of people who are really hurting right now. They are, they are many of the people that back the candidate that did not win the last presidential election. These folks are not just some assault rifle toting neo-fascists that we see on TV. They are members of our families, our friends, our doctors, our fellow teachers, the clerk at the subway. In this particular now, we are called to stand with them in their very real grief and pain. You may be saying to yourself, why should I do that? Why do I care if they suffer? Two reasons. First, the future of our democracy may depend on us learning to respect and love each other across the political divide. And second, because you must do so for your own, for your own salvation and healing. You also may be saying to yourself, where can I find the love necessary for such a monumental task? To find the answer to that question, we must, as the theme of this servant's service suggests, look back. On the front of your bulletin is a quote by one of our founding parents the transcendentalist Ralph Waldo Emerson. Emerson said, what lies behind you and what lies in front of you pales in comparison to what lies inside you. In each of us is a greatness, a deep and abiding love that transcends time, space, and causality and will, when we draw from it, sustain us spiritually and provide the manna that will enable us to stand with those among us who suffer from the pain and grief of losing their hero. The opportunity to stand with is at hand and we all can take advantage of it. And let us continue. It's the story for all ages. Um, hi, I'm gonna read uh, this book that recreates the wonder of Henry David Thoreau's Moonlight Walks. At least Henry's Night. July 12th. I cannot sleep. The sounds of the village keeps me awake. The evening train whistles, dogs bark, and from the room below, voices drift up to me. If only I could hear the songs the night bird sings, I'd take my collecting jar and go down the stairs. The branches of my beech tree bend and pull me in. I sit up to my chin in night and listen for the bird. All I hear are berry pickers coming home from the hills and the village bell tolling. Bong. Nine o'clock. The night bird does not sing here. I slide down from the tree and leave the village. Now I walk on the dirt road. Crunch, crunch, crunch. The scuffing of my boots is loud. So I step into a field to listen for the night song. I hear nothing. The meadow twinkles with fireflies. They float around me, blinking on and off like shooting stars. I 
I capture fireflies, they fill my jar with light. A bird swoops low to my lantern, and I ask, are you the one who sings the song of night? Pete! Not I, the nighthawk says, as it wings through the woods. I run after, spilling fireflies as I go. The village clock strikes ten. Ten o'clock already. I stride off into the woods towards the rising moon. I walk on and on as the moon grows brighter. There is no path. Far off, I hear a bird sing. Whippoorwill, whippoorwill. There, there is the song of night. The bird calls me to follow. Up hill and down, I follow the night's bird song. Each time I get close, it stops singing. Now I hear a pumper bird gulping water in the brook. Which way did the weeper wheel go? I ask. Wong kaka shunk, wong kaka shunk. It flew far from the village, the pumper bird tells me. So I fill my yard with water and hike deeper into the woods. The village clock strikes 12. When I hear the night bird again, it calls from ahead. Then from behind, it leads me in circles. Now it sings from beyond the hill. I hurry on to see the bird. Wait for me, whippoorwill. A tree root trips me. My jar, my jar rolls away into a swamp. I scoop up my jar from the muddy bottom to see tadpoles wiggling in the moonlight. All around me, frogs croak. Have you seen the whippoorwill? I ask. Prong, prong. No one ever sees that bird, a frog tells me. Very far away, the village clock strikes two. Clouds erase the moon. Is that thunder I hear? Raindrops bounce from my head. Lightning flashes in my yard. I leap from grassy mound to grassy mound across the swamp. Rain falls hard now, but it will not stop me. Let it pour down. I will see the bird no one sees. Wind blows me uphill, brambles grab my head, and rain soaks me. I cannot hear the bell in the village anymore. From a hemlock tree, an owl calls. Hoo hoo, hoo hoo, who cooks for you? Owl, I ask, am I lost? The owl does not say, so I walk on. The rain stops. Here where the woods ends is all quiet. I stand on the shore of a mysterious lake. White fog spreads white. It rolls from edge to edge of all I see. How will I get home? I make a raft of branches and push off into the mist. I bend down and scoop a feather into my jar. At my back, something flutters. Something sits on my head. Whippoorwill, whippoorwill. It sits into my ear. The night bird has found me. I feel the beat of its bird heart. Past two islands I paddle. The raft, the fog, the bird song, and I. All are as light as morning air. The bird leaves me. A bush poking above the fog snags my raft. Down through leaves I tumble. Is this the beech tree in my yard? I, slow, I slide down its branches to the ground. No one hears me go up the stairs. I lie in bed and wait for the noise of the morning train. Instead comes a call. Whippoorwill, whippoorwill. The song of night. The notes flow from my jar and fill the day with the night's bird song. I sleep. That's the end. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. That was a very lovely, lovely uh, story. I've heard the at night song uh, many times when I used to take long walks in the dark. And, uh, you know, after a while, you don't even need to be outside in the dark to hear the song. So let's move on now to our offering. This fellowship is a community of ourselves. Its resources are our resources. Its wealth is what we share. 
if we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm our lives within it. And thank you all for your generosity. Lisa Fuller, rather. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Since its inception in 1959, Buff has been addressing social justice issues. This order of service is from November 9th, 1975. And you can see that the reading that day was Let America Be America Again by Langston Hughes. And the speaker that day was William A. Morris, Jr., who at the time was a national housing director for the NAACP. I don't know the circumstances behind how Mr. Morris came to speak at Buff on November 9th, some 45 years ago. But I did look up Mr. Morris and he was a fascinating humanitarian uh, from Staten Island. His father, William A. Morris Sr., founded the Staten Island chapter of NAACP. The NAACP was formed in 1909 as an interracial endeavor to advance justice for Blacks. Mary White Ovington was a UU 
And she was one of the founding members and the very first secretary for the NAACP. The final stanzas of the Langston Hughes poem that was featured on this day at, on November 9th at Boston, 1975. The final stanzas of the Langston Hughes poem are, oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. Out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we the people must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains and the endless plain, all, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. One of the 2020 actions of an uh, immediate witness at this year's UUA General Assembly was Amen for Uprising, a call to action for UUs to engage in the larger movement to end anti-Blackness and defund police. With attention to our universalist theology, all are good, all are saved, we imagine the possibility of a world free from policing. This Amen for Uprising action of immediate witness affirms our renewed commitment to creating authentic justice rather than relying on state violence. So do you think that Buff will take on this action, Amen to Uprising? The Buff Board and other members of Buff are developing our five-year plan. A new five-year plan is in the works. Buff's mission is to be a welcoming, caring religious community dedicated to diversity of thought, social and environmental justice, and peace for all. That means there's always going to be important work toward justice. It's good to be in community working together toward justice for all, but we need to keep a few things in mind. From Unitarian minister, Edward Everett Hale, this quote, I am only one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And also from the Reverend Hale, together, one of the most important, inspiring words of the English language. Coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress. Working together is success. Thank you all for being in community with Buff, for being dedicated to justice, and for doing what you can, when you can, with what you have. We cannot do everything, but we can do something. Stay with us. Amen. Amen, yes. Yeah. James Baldwin, our lives and our hopes. As much as possible, I'll be using Baldwin's own words in these reflections on a phrase used across generations of Black American writers, between the world and me. In 2015, ta Coates received the National Book Award for a book with the resting title, Between the World and Me. Mr. Coates composes the text as a letter to his son and uses this intimate literary form to launch a dialogue not just with his son, but with all of us, about the history of the American nation. Coates borrowed his title from a poem by a black writer from an earlier generation, Richard Wright, from Wright's poem. And one morning, while in the woods, I stumbled suddenly upon the thing, stumbled upon it in a grassy clearing 
guarded by scaly oaks and elms. And the sooty details of the scene rose, thrusting themselves between the world and me. Whatever it is that Richard Wright unexpectedly encountered in the woods, he gives this thing no name, it becomes a powerful barrier in his life, thrusting between the world and me. In the decades between Richard Wright and Tanaisi Coates, the same phrase appeared in a slender book written in 1963 by James Baldwin, entitled The Fire Next Time. There, Baldwin recalled a moment of reckoning during his own early adolescence. That summer, all the fears with which I had grown up and which were now a part of me and controlled my vision of the world rose up like a wall between the world and me. Like Tanahisi Coates, James Baldwin writes autobiographically, moving outward from his own life and family to interpret the perilous situation of the American nation as a whole. He recalled his father, a minister in Harlem, who was defeated long before he died because at the bottom of his heart, he really believed what white people said about him. This tragic memory leads Baldwin to give urgent advice in a letter to his nephew. Across many generations, the details and symbols of your life have been deliberately constructed to make you believe what white people say about you. You were born in a society that spelled out with brutal clarity what the limits of your ambitions were. You were not expected to aspire to excellence. You were expected to make peace with mediocrity. The paradox, and a fearful paradox it is, is that the American Negro can have no future anywhere on any continent as long as he is unwilling to accept his past. To accept one's past, one's history, is not the same thing as drowning in it. It is learning how to use it. How can the American Negro's past be used? The unprecedented price demanded, and at this embattled moment of the world's history, is to transcend the socially constructed walls of color, of nationality, and of religion. Now, there is no possibility of a real change in the Negro situation without the most radical and far-reaching changes in the American political and social structure. And it is clear that white Americans are simply not, will, un, will, un, are not simply unwilling to effect these changes. They are in the main unable even to envision them. As this suggests, Baldwin believes that white Americans are likewise trapped in a history which they do not understand. And until they understand it, they cannot be released from it. And, any, and even though many of them indeed know better, it is difficult to see, it's difficult to act on what they know, since to act is to be committed, and to be committed is to be in danger. In this case, the danger in the minds of most white Americans is the loss of their identity, because that identity too largely depends on contrasting it with others of different color, different nationality, and different religion. 
Baldwin worries that people, black and white, have so little desire to shoulder the burden of their lives. But, he affirms, we are capable of bearing a great burden once we discover that the burden is reality and arrive where reality is. We are living in an age of revolution, whether we will or no, and America is the only Western nation with both the power and, as I hope to suggest, the experience that may help to make these revolutions real. Taking up the revolutionary burden of reality, in short, is the decision to breach the wall between the world and me. Baldwin concludes that everything now we must assume is in our hands. We have no right to assume otherwise. If we, and now I mean the relatively conscious whites and the relatively conscious blacks, who must, like lovers, insist on or create the consciousness of the others, do not falter in our duty now. We may be able, handful that we are, to end the racial nightmare and achieve our country. If we do not now dare everything, the fulfillment of that prophecy recreated in the Bible in a song sung by a slave is upon us. God gave the Noah the rainbow, excuse me, God gave Noah the rainbow sign. No more water, the fire next time. Thank you. May nothing evil cross this door and may ill fortune never pry about these windows may the roar and rain go by by faith made strong the Stand the battering of the storm, this hearth, the wall, the world grow chill. Out of old habit, I want to share with you the sources I use for today's sermon. The historical portions come primarily from David Park's book, The Epic of Unitarianism, 
pages 104 to 125 for those of you who look to minutia. And the transcript, though I saw the original broadcast, the transcript for Dave Chappelle's remarks come from the Monday, November 9th issue art section of the New York Times. Dave Chappelle is a black comedian raised Unitarian Universalist. He hosted the episode of NBC's Saturday Night Live that immediately followed the 2016 election. He expected to humorously usher in a Hillary Clinton presidency. Instead, he got to observe We've elected an internet troll as our president. The audience groaned and laughed nervously. Then Chappelle surprised them. I'm wishing Donald Trump luck, he said, and I'm going to give him a chance. And we, the historically disenfranchised, demand that he give us a chance too. One week ago, Dave Chappelle hosted SNL again and reminded Joe Biden it's good to be a humble winner. And then he asked the audience, remember when I was here four years ago? Remember how bad that felt? Half the country right now still feels that way, just a different half. We have to find a way to forgive each other. Chappelle then added, for the first time in America, the life expectancy of white people is dropping because of heroin, because of suicide. All those white people out there that feel that anguish, that pain, they're mad because they think nobody cares. And maybe they're right. But let me tell you something. I promise you I know how that feels. If you're a police officer and every time you put on your uniform, you feel like you've got a target on your back. You're appalled by the ingratitude that people have when you would risk your life to save theirs. Believe me, I know how that feels. You've got to find a way to live your life. That's what I'd tell them. You've got to find a way to forgive each other. You've got to find a way to find joy in your existence in spite of that feeling. That same Saturday, President-elect Joe Biden told the country that while I am a Democratic candidate, I will govern as an American president. Joe knows there are many on the political right who have no interest in any sort of middle ground or common agenda with him. He knows there are many on the left with strong partisan feelings for whom the prospect of compromising in any way progressive political values seems unthinkable. And many you use, as we know, are among those fiercely committed progressives. But we shouldn't ever forget that some of us are not. It is probable that thousands of our fellow UUs voted two weeks ago for Donald Trump. Among the people I remember well at the UU congregations I served, I can think of several who most likely voted that way. To what extent are we willing to look for common ground? to implement the values we share. I believe all of us as religious liberals and as political beings must, as Dave Chappelle suggests, find a way to live with those questions, their attendant feelings, and ultimately with one another. In 1969, Black Unitarian Universalists asked our General Assembly delegates to create a $1 million fund for black empowerment. One delegate in my church explained his yes vote by invoking the martyrdom <clears throat> of James Reed and Viola Liuzzo, you used killed during the Selma demonstrations. Many in our congregation were enthused about what was being reported 
but there was also the question asked by our church treasurer. I think it's a great idea, he said, but did you figure out how to pay for it? No, we didn't, was the quick reply. Our job was to get it passed. It's somebody else's job to find the money. We all know what happens to good projects when carrying them out becomes somebody else's job. The UUA with declining church contributions and crippling personnel costs did not find the money. In fact, the UUA nearly went bankrupt. Valued denominational staff were lost and the second installment of black empowerment money was delayed and ultimately canceled. Many black UUs left our denomination angry and disillusioned. But we should always remember that fiscally and socially conservative UUs who may have had their doubts about the empowerment program largely stayed but were disillusioned too. I regret that we have lost so many of them since and not found a way to stay together. A few years after, I asked a different congregation how they felt about the now abandoned Black Empowerment Commitment and its aftermath. And a number of sincere members told me, we agree with you on the need for significant social action, but it can't completely take up the energy and money required by other needs of our church community. In our current denominational conversations, 40 years later, so movingly reported on by Lisa and Joanne and Catherine last week, it seems to me sometimes that perhaps we still haven't fully found the ways to forgive one another. I don't want to give the impression that this is the only controversy we've dealt with in recent times. In fact, there have been many of them. I'll mention just one more. By the 1980s, a growing earth-centered spirituality attracted many UUs, influenced by such voices as Unitarian biologist Rachel Carson. It also attracted a number of Midwestern neo-pagan communities, and one of those groups, Panthea, applied for recognition as a UU member congregation. It was extremely controversial, the Central Midwest meeting where it was considered because we were the district to say yes or no to Panthea headquartered in Chicago. The arguments raged into the night. Many of my follow, fellow humanists were opposed to Panthea's application. They felt pagans were far too supernaturally oriented to be UUs. Also opposed were UU theists who saw in pagan groups what they believed to be an anti-Christian bias. Both humanists and theists were worried that new pagan congregations would fundamentally change UUA's character. Which I think was strange considering how recently the chief controversy in our denomination had been the bitter antagonisms between humanists and theists. It's now the case that pagans and earth-centered spiritualists make up over 20% of all you use, and their views are recognized in our purposes and principles. But I still think the tensions and suspicions of one another that surrounded their first approach to us still remain. Such conflicts are nothing new to Unitarians. We were birthed in early 19th century political and theological fights, dissenting from the established order of congregational churches, lifting up liberal prayer books and services, backing rebel faculty at the Harvard Divinity School. By 1820, Unitarians were contending openly for the control of traditional Christian passages, parishes, excuse me. At the Dedham, Massachusetts Church, 
the insurgents called the non-Trinitarian minister to the pulpit. The Orthodox members went to court to claim the church building and assets as their own and lost. The schism, schism quickly widened. Angry members on both sides were walking away from churches that had welcomed their families for generations. There's even an account, probably ap ap apocryphal, of one triumphant contingent chasing the defeated members out of their church front door and across the village green. Within a few years, a quarter of the Massachusetts congregations turned Unitarian. By 1825, they had formed the American Unitarian Association. But no sooner had they settled into their new denominational identity than dissent started again. This time it was the transcendentalists who were hammering on the door, taking on the newly orthodox, so recently rebels themselves. After just two years of preaching, Ralph Waldo Emerson got bored and left the Unitarian ministry over a lack of what he called spiritual inspiration. Fame as a transcendentalist writer for Emerson followed, and the starstruck students invited him to deliver the 1839 Harvard Divinity School Address. In a stunning 90-minute essay, Emerson set forth a brand new religious expression of nature and the collective soul, of daily life as miracle and ritual enough and of a very, very human Jesus. The divinity students loved it. The divinity faculty did not. Professor Andrews Norton made public his disgust and disapprobation. The Christian Examiner, a Unitarian journal, called the address neither good divinity nor good sense. But West Roxbury minister Theodore Parker said, it was the noblest and most inspiring strain I ever listened to. It was Parker in 1841 who carried Emerson's thought forward in an ordination address titled The Transient and the Permanent in Christianity. All particular rites, doctrines, and sects, he said, were merely transient and therefore elements of religion that could be dispensed with. The permanent, what has to be clung to, he claimed, included a few core teachings of Jesus, which he summed up as doing the best thing in the best way, and the principle of active love. Today we might call that social justice. In response, Parker was shunned by other Unitarian ministers, and few would exchange pulpits with him. One minister who did saw 15 church families resign afterward. Ten years later, Parker spoke to his fellow Boston ministers on the subject of abolition. Reverend Ezra Gannett called Parker an infidel, demanded he obey the fugitive slave law, and Parker, having seen one black member of his church already kidnapped back into slavery, replied that he would defend the others with the pistol he kept loaded in the church office. He added for good measure that Gannett, while an honest man, was certainly no Christian. Politics became more bitter. The pro and anti-slavery fervor spread throughout the country. And Unitarians, as Unitarians are often wont to do, continued to fight theologically. In 1865, as war broke out, we formed the National Conference of Unitarian Churches, avowedly orthodox. And then just two years later, other Unitarians formed the Free Religious Association, unapologetically non-conforming, non-credal, and heavily post-Christian. Congregations immediately took sides, as did preachers. Alliances formed and shifted. 
it took us the rest of the 19th century to bring those two factions back from the brink of total and complete separation. We liberal religionists have moved forward always by means of disagreement and debate and disappointment in one another. There has hardly been a time when we didn't engage in what could hopefully be called creative conflict. The brief histories I have shared today resulted from arguments between major theological figures where entire congregations or significant minorities within congregations split off angrily from one another. What history doesn't tell us, cannot tell us, are the countless personal stories of separation and loss that occurred as well. I celebrate the social choice causes we have championed but have we also paid enough attention to the costs to individuals, to ourselves, individuals who have pulled away in despair over the constant agitation, individuals who found themselves on the losing side of a church argument once too often, and who, if they have not left, have stepped back from leadership or active support of the congregations that they love. Excuse me, that's my Marco Rubio moment. Joe Biden said to us this week, the people who voted for my opponent are not our enemies. They are Americans and we must find ways to unite as Americans. Or in our sphere, as one UU online put it last week, those who disagree with us on fundamental questions of our faith should be seen as legitimate ethical adversaries, but never as our enemies. My friends, let us by all means fight boldly as Unitarian Universalists for justice. Let us con continue those historic trends, but let us make sure we do so with love in our hearts, love for those who cannot agree with us. Let us reach out and build whenever we can common ground, knowing that while enemies will often fight to the point of destruction, loving adversaries have at least, at least some hope of moving forward through conflict together. May it be so in our nation. May it be so in this, our beloved community. And Roger, thank you. Wonderful. us over, when the winds of the world leave, leave us spinning, when the voices of the world lead us astray, 
May we remember that here, home is always waiting, with stillness to calm us, friends to anchor us, and voices to help us find our way. Amen. Thank you.